Hi and welcome back to the Open Biotech vlogging series. Great that you're watching. Uh, over the course of the past few weeks I've been traveling across Europe and I've talked to biohackers everywhere. And I did that because I'm writing a policy paper for the European Commission on biohacking. All right, here we go. Okay, I think we need a little bit more of inspiration to start writing. I already got stuck after just a few sentences. Perhaps it's a good idea to take a look at what other people said about do-it-yourself bio at the European Stakeholder Roundtable in Paris. Um, because I remember that they were speaking about their keywords to describe do-it-yourself bio and I think that's what I need. Okay, my definition of citizen science would be um, community participation in meaningful scientific inquiry. And I guess my three keywords would be, um, yeah, participation, autonomy, and um, inquiry. Um, citizen science for me is the ability for anyone to address a scientific question using a scientific approach with or without the help of a professional scientist. So the three key words are curiosity, method and inclusiveness. Hello, my name is Hank Belder. Citizen science for me is when citizens are partners in the scientific research. It means we need partnership, we need equality and we need complementary skills and knowledges. Hi, uh, so my name is Lucy Patterson. I'm one of the co-organisers of um, an annual volunteer-run hackathon in Berlin called Science Hack Day. And um, how would you define citizen science in one sentence? Well, I would say that citizen science is um, the civil society version of science. It's regular people, including scientists who don't work inside the academic system, carrying out science for their own purposes. Or it could also be the same regular people working together with science um, to provide expertise, different societal perspectives, or to hold science to account. Um, and in three words I'd say, three or so words I'd say, it's about self-empowerment, it's about the knowledge society, and it's about openness and accountability. <laughs> Hi, Colette. Hello. Um, Citizen science to me is when um, the general public, members of society who don't normally practice science, get involved in science projects that actually have a meaningful outcome. Public, um, meaningful science, I know it's not three words, but... <laughs> So the reason I got into science in the first place is because when I was 11 years old I participated in the Cambridge Ladybird survey and this was um, a citizen science project where they asked uh, members of the public to record um, the types and number of species of ladybirds that they could find in their local environment and they produced maps and this was actually the first time there'd been a comprehensive exercise uh, recording all the different types of ladybirds. This has become really important now that there's invasive species, we're able to see the impact of that, um, but it was the first thing that got me into reading scientific literature and feeling that I could contribute to um, meaningful um, sort of scientific questions about how species were distributed and where they were found. When I was younger I was part of a bird ringing project and I think bird watching in general has always been a very successful citizen science initiative worldwide, so I, won't, I would consider this one of my favourite projects. Now, DIY biology is about adopting a low-cost and inclusive approach to biology. Um, it's been used mostly around laboratory biology so far. The three keywords are open source, low-cost and ingenuity. Now, the three main obstacles to collaborations are the absence of funding mechanisms for non-institutional scientists, the lack of incentives for academics to collaborate with citizen scientists, and the lack of understanding between these two communities. So for an example of citizen science uh, that comes to my mind, well, I'm a big fan of Public Lab's DIY environmental monitoring, but since we're here to talk about DIY bio, DIY bio then um, I would talk about um, artist biohacker Mary Tsang, Mary Magic, 
and her open source Estrogen project. Um, so in collaboration with different biohacking and bio art communities around the world, she's been developing this, um, it's a gender hacking project that's kind of part real, part speculative, um, social resistance and consciousness raising um, project that's criticising how institutions and scientific fields are defining gender through biology, um, touting hormones as the biological determinants of sexual identities. And her work is performative but very hands-on and um, she runs a lot of workshops. Um, she's explored different experimental strategies for um, DIY extraction of hormones from different things, from like urine, from waste or polluted environmental sources. Um, and she's also created a gen genetically engineered yeast biosensor um, to detect trace estrogen in water systems. So an example I know from um, a collaboration at the John Innes Centre and the Sainsbury Lab um, in Norwich is they developed um, a Facebook game to help them put together, called Fraxinus, to help them put together the genome of um, the ash dieback um, fungus. Oh, definition of do-it-yourself biology is a bit... Yeah, I guess it's using um, tools that are easily or readily available um, to perhaps conduct experiments or to measure different things. And I guess my three key words would be accessibility, um, instructions, and um, community. Now, DIY biology is about adopting a low-cost and inclusive approach to biology. Um, it's been used mostly around laboratory biology so far. The three keywords are open source, low cost and ingenuity. So, um, DIY Bio is doing biology related projects outside of an institution, by yourself or with others, out of interest to learn, to prove that it's possible and for the joy of hacking, or for personal or artistic expression, or to respond to societal or civic challenges that are not otherwise being solved. And in three words, I would say similar to citizen science, it's about um, independence and self-empowerment, it's about counterculture, and it's also simply about the joy of hacking, learning and discovery. So do-it-yourself biology um, is for me, it's biology outside of a traditional lab setting, so it might be in a lab, but not in a research lab in an academic institute, for example, but in a different setting that can bring together a number of different backgrounds. Three key words for do-it-yourself biology. Um, Non-traditional. Um, uh, what else? <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> fun, sure. Yes, it can be fun. <laughs> now, the three main obstacles to collaborations are the absence of funding mechanisms for non-institutional scientists, the lack of incentives for academics to collaborate with citizen scientists, and the lack of understanding between these two communities. In terms of building bridges between citizens and institutions, I guess it's enabling citizens to collect the kinds of data that are useful um, to scientific inquiry and perhaps also for um, the scientists involved to come up with new ways to make their science a bit more accessible. Um, I think the general public um, really do want to participate but they often lack the means or the, um, the link to be able to um, kind of interact with institutions. I think through the web, through uh, open source platforms and through kind of different um, sort of web resources, I think that's those barriers are breaking down. But it's to enable um, participants to also feel that the data they would collect or the measurements they would make would be meaningful enough and that they would be useful um, to scientific researchers. The main issues linking citizens and institutions are, um, I think, a communication barrier um, between people who have a strong background in science and those who have a lot of knowledge but not necessarily the same academic background. Um, also access to facilities, necessary facilities. Um, and also the access to the background information to be able to, to start on projects. 
Um, and I think I could break it down into three main issues. So the first issue would be why should grassroots and institutions work together? So first of all, grassroots don't necessarily want to work with institutions. Um, there are a lot of DIY scientists out there who are choosing to work independently in order to avoid institutions. So maybe it's the culture of publish or perish, it's the lack of diversity inside institutions, it's um, lack of opportunities for young scientists, um, and they'd rather work independently. But it's always nice to come together and find um, opportunities to collaborate. So there are situations where it could be mutually beneficial. So um, I'd say uh, benefiting from each other's expertise. Um, institutions can provide access to facilities that DIY scientists don't otherwise have access to. Um, the grassroots can provide access to specific context-dependent experience, to um, community innovation, which is, can be much more agile than the kind of innovation you can achieve inside an institution, and the wider geographical reach. Um, and there would also be the potential to uh, jointly apply for funding, as there aren't very many funding sources that are available to grassroots projects. Um, secondly, secondly, I would say um, it's important to realise how different institutions and grassroots projects are. There's definitely a power imbalance. So institutions um, can launch projects with relatively lower risk. They, those who are applying for funding are supported to do so, so they, they can use their paid time. Um, the institutional reputation and connections, um, often they have in-house advice on grant writing, uh, legal issues, financial issues, um, and people who work for institutions are able to do their citizen science work on their own work time, so they can cover cost of registration fees for conferences and travel expenses, um, but on the other hand they move slowly, uh, they have large overheads to cover, and they don't um, have access to the same communities and the knowledge and experience of grassroots projects, grassroots communities. On the other hand, grassroots projects are typically volunteer run or underfunded. Um, there are far fewer run funding resources available to, um, to grassroots projects, especially if the organisation is not managed to attain legal status, which can be a big administrative hurdle for a grassroots project. Um, and applying with funding comes with much greater risk. Um, together with regulatory hurdles, um, it, the scope of grassroots projects can be really limited. Um, the scope of what they're able to achieve can be very limited. Um, however, on the plus side, they have lower costs, fewer overheads. Um, their motivation is much more intrinsic, so we're talking about passion rather than this desperate need to publish or perish. Um, and with um, increasing open science and a high number of young scientists who are exiting academia um, and also the, the potential for really natural interdisciplinarity that we have in grassroots projects, um, they can be really full of expertise. So the third big issue um, is the lack of understanding. So it's important to remember that as grassroots projects are often volunteer run, you need to address the fact that they're not paid to take part in joint projects, unlike institutional partners. Um, they can't attend meetings during working hours, um, and they need a very good reason uh, to take part if they're going to give up their spare time. Um, they don't have access to the kind of resources to pay for travel expenses and high registration fees for conferences. So these are very simple, basic issues, but if they're not addressed, then you may still get some grassroots projects to take part, but um, you'll be selecting for those that have managed to get over that hurdle and achieve um, some level of independence and uh, funding, um, but you will be missing out on the reality of most of the grassroots projects. Um, which is not inclusive and the most marginalised projects will never be able to take part. So if you combine that with the domination of citizen science by institutional projects in terms of policy, in terms of access to funding, 
um, in terms of professional development and conferences, then um, the potential relationship between grassroots and institutions and the trust um, has already been rather damaged. So it's going to be a question of rebuilding that trust and creating the right opportunities for grassroots and institutions to collaborate. But the benefits will definitely be worth it. I think things are progressing pretty nicely. Um, I think I've rewritten the title of the policy paper already 10 times, um, completely started over our, the whole document a few times. But now things are shaping up and I feel like the introduction is getting pretty well set. And now I have to move on to uh, describing the case studies. And from there, I will be able to do an analysis on the uh, uh, societal uh, aspects, the research, uh, responsible research innovation aspects, and um, a description of the potential impact of do-it-yourself bio uh, in case it gets some extra funding.